on you and learning from you, teach by your Holy Spirit, Lord, help us to not just be hearers but doers, and that we, uh, the thoughts and the intents of our heart might be pleasing in your sight, our God and our Redeemer, Lord, we just thank you and ask you to guide and direct and bless this time together, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so in number 45, oh, <laughs> Comforter has come. Oh, 
standing for prayer. Our brother Donnell, would you ask the Lord's blessing? Yes, Lord, we thank you for the blessings you've given to us. Lord, the blessings today that will be given to us through your word. Lord, may we see uh, you in the word. May we, uh, may, it have, may we have ears to hear, feet to go, and hands to do your bidding. But Lord, we want to thank you for your, your comfort, for our families that have lost a loved one, my sister, Dan, his mom. Lord, we thank you that only you can comfort the heart. And Lord, the biggest comfort is to know where they are. Absent from the bodies to be present with you. We thank you, Lord, that you've made a place. You have a provision for each of your saints. And we ask, Lord, today where your word is preached, that that comfort and that peace uh, that passes all understanding will be in our hearts today through your word. We thank you in your name. Amen. Nice to see it. And also, uh, about a week ago yesterday, Bud Johnson, many of you know him, he passed away. He's with the Lord now. Lord, so, pray for the Johnson family. All right, so if you can now turn to 633, 633. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Uh, 
I want to thank everybody that prayed for her complete healing, for she is completely healed. It was Friday at 7.15 when she went home to the Lord. Amen. So, well, that's what Dan's, uh, Dan's prayer was, and the Bible says that he will heal with all our diseases. So all of her diseases are healed. What a blessing. Amen. <clears throat> okay. And uh, Monday, prayer meeting for Israel. And Wednesday, prayer meeting over here. And next Sunday, this 9, 8, 9.30, regular services with Colin preaching. Um, let's continue to pray for our government. Um, federal, state, locally, persecuted brethren. Jeffrey Woodkey. Um, Oliver, <laughs> all of our missionaries, we need to continue to pray for them. We have over over there, there's a board with all the missionaries. If you don't have their picture, and this is what's kind of neat, because for me, it would, with a picture on the refrigerator, it's a lot easier to pray for these guys if you don't know them. And then when we've been doing the videos, that really, really helps, helps uh, us know who these people are and how we can pray for them. So... Continue to pray for our sick. You know what? That second name there, we can mark out. No longer sick. There's Margie and Myrna. Betsy, Dan, Ed, Lydia, Rachel, Diane Prairie, Roberta, Mike, Jolie, Tom, and Stella. And then uh, recovery for Sterling. The recovery. And, um, and for Dan, let's pray for those with cancer. Jeanette, Tom, Mike, Don, uh, which is Suzanne's brother. I think they're both on that retreat down there. So. And then Lydia, where's Lydia? Lydia had her surgery and she's here today. So, yeah, so she's going to be back playing tennis next week. I think. <laughs> <laughs> Pickleball now, yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, and then let's just continue to pray for those grieving, the Willetson family, the Hales, and our dear Bud Johnson used to speak here with. 95, so let's pray for the Johnson sisters. But uh, also, okay, the college students, Caleb, Josiah, Peter, Elijah, let's pray for them. All the unsaved loved ones that we uh, we have, those that we run across, let's be bold, share the gospel boldly. Pray for the outreach, broadcasts, Soron, Tom's broadcast, CEF, Good News Clubs, Real Life Ministries, Mobile Dental Vans, and the Whitefields National Pastors. Let's continue to hold all these up in prayer. Yes. Also, uh, Jean Mayer's uh, recovery from her fractured oh, wrist. It's going a little slow. But her wrist and her ankle spine, it's, it's, she's still having a little trouble getting dressed and twisting. Okay, she's not home yet? No. Is she going home? Okay. Well, let's pray for Jean. All right, anybody have anything else? Yes, so far. Uh, I appreciate every time uh, you guys pray for our radio ministry. I wanted to report from last week. We have three Afghans inside Afghanistan. Came to faith by God's grace, came to faith, responded to the gospel, and gave their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ. Stand and turn to number four seven six. Four seven six. Ring the bell of heaven.
we just thank you, Lord, for these souls that came to Christ that our brother Sarab mentioned. We know the angels were rejoicing when their names are added to the Lamb's Book of Life. And we pray, Lord, that they would uh, be discipled, that they'd grow in you, that they would be in the Word and abiding in you, Lord, that they might be a witness to many, that they might see the hope of Christ in them. Lord, we pray for our nation that's in great need. Lord, help us to humble ourselves and pray and seek your face and turn from our wicked ways that you might hear from heaven, forgive our sin, and heal our land, Lord. Help the revival to begin with us, Lord. We just thank you for your goodness, that you're not uh, willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance, Lord. We pray for our president, vice president, those in Congress, the co uh, governors, and also mayors and world leaders, Lord, that that they would know that they must give an account to you. We pray, Lord, open their eyes that they might seek your wisdom in the decisions that they make. Continue to be with persecuted brethren around the world that they would remain steadfast in the faith and be a witness to those that are persecuting them as Paul and Silas, Lord, that even the jailer and his whole family came to you because of their testimony. And we pray that there would be similar things happening in the lives of these persecuted brethren with their captives turning to you, Lord. Continue to be with Jeffrey Woodkey and his family. Continue to be with our sick. Lord, that they might know your, your grace that's sufficient. That they might be reminded, Lord, that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that would be revealed in us. That we have a high priest that has been touched with the feelings of our infirmities. Lord, and we just pray that they would be comforted in knowing that they're not alone as they go through these trials, that Jesus is with them, never leaving them or forsaking them. We pray, Lord, for those grieving the loss of loved ones, Lord, that they would be comforted in knowing that they'll be reunited in glory when we stand before our Savior face to face. Continue to be with, with Dan and the Johnson family, Lord, for the Willitsons, the Ailes, and Lord, others that are uh, suffering loss, Lord, that they would be comforted, Lord, by your word, which is our comfort and our affliction. We pray, Lord, for college students, Lord, help them to be steadfast in the faith. We heard this morning during Sunday school how a lot of colleges, even Christian ones, are putting the lies out there the millions and billions of years, and even though the evidence from your word and from this world show that it's a young earth, and in the beginning God created everything. We pray, Lord, for unsaved loved ones, that you would bring someone across their path to share with them the words of life, Lord, that they would be pricked in their hearts by the Holy Spirit and have a godly sorrow that works repentance unto salvation. Continue to bless the broadcast going forth from the chapel through Thomas Arab and bless the retreat that's going on down there now and for a blessed uh, time and for a safe trip back. Continue to raise up uh, laborers, Lord, for the harvest. Lord, the three-person teams for the Good News Clubs and Lord, that you would continue to bless all the missionaries that we support here at the chapel, that they might uh, have all their needs met by you, and that we would lift them up to you in prayer, that we might be fellow laborers with them as they seek to bring lost ones to yourself. Now help us to turn our eyes upon Jesus, and Lord, be listening with ready minds, and not just be hearers, but doers, and be available and usable for you. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Yeah. All right, so now we're going to have a missionary spotlight. So put the screen down here and turn the projector on. Just going.
Shalom. Shalom. Uh, Shabbat Shalom. That means Happy New Year. This, uh, this evening, our time. Sorry, New Year's in Israel. So, welcome. Um, in Matthew 10, 23, Yeshua, Jesus said, You shall have not have gone over the cities of Israel until the Son of Man shall be come. That's a simple statement and has simple math. The math is, has Jesus come? No. So that means the job of going over all the cities of Israel is unfinished. Now, cities of Israel, of course, you come to Israel, you'll see high rises going up all over the place. It's like mushrooms. You go along the the, the, the shoreline, you drive down the main highway, and you'll see all these high rises going up everywhere. And uh, Jewish people, as well as Gentiles, not many, but they do come, are coming to the land. But I will say this, that it's important to remember when we think of the cities of Israel, that it's referring also to the cities of Jewish people all over the world. And uh, when we think of missionary moment, we think of histories in the past. So, for those of you who are new here, this little aisle right here is a place where Jim Nader would intercede sometimes several hours a day. So Rob is shaking his head because he knows, and some of you here have been long, around long enough to know that is part of prayer. And what came out of that, of course, to the Jew first and also to the non-Jew. So that's just right here. And of course, out of that, Tom is doing the work all around the world. Um, we're serving in Israel. And uh, there's opportunities. We have guests here. And we're thankful for opportunities to see the good news of Yeshua going to the Jewish diaspora. So you're in Tennessee and probably other places you're seeking, and they tell me that you're sponsored by a local church. You know, that's the idea, see? Just a simple congregation of believers that get a hold of the idea to the Jew first. So, I want to tell you a quick story. Um, back before Israel was a state, uh, during the mandatory period, that's when the British had control of Israel, or the, the land of Israel, um, there was a mission called British Jewish Society. And if you were to come to our place, our house of prayer, where we pray for mobilization, we pray for all the needs and the sewing, um, we can show you a room where you will see PJS. And so, a place born of prayer. Now this mission was a medical mission in its history. And a doctor would go on a donkey, and he would go up and down the areas of Haifa and give out his medical expertise, and also he would share his faith. Well, during one of his tours, there was a tent city that was growing in the you know, east of Haifa area during the time of just right after Israel became a state, they started having need for bringing in all these new people coming in. So they had a tent city and there was a shortage of doctors. So this Dr. Churcher would go and minister to the various people that were in these tents. And among them in that tent city was my wife's parents from Poland, grandparents from Poland, and also my wife's later, this is going to happen, and I'm not sure if Dr. Churcher had seen them, we just know on the Polish side, but on the other side, from Iraq, um, they were also in the tent city, so who knows how many times those doctors saw patients and their light shined by their example and sometimes by their word. And this kind of thing is going on all the time. 
there's opportunities to share. It's a verbal thing, we share the faith, but it's also an action thing, um, just a little pickup. We uh, were called in, and one of the congregations was burdened for the Bedouin people in the Golan. And this Bedouin village had three families, it's typical in the, that situation, two rich ones and one poor one. And the, the rich ones were kind of making the poor ones look bad. And their teenagers were going around and being the graffiti, troublemakers, robbing, you know, you know the drill. Well, this congregation was burdened. So they asked us to come in and, of all things, to simply pick up trash. And nobody in the whole area was interested in these Bedouin people. We simply went in and picked up trash. So you see, ladies and gentlemen, we have power in the word, and sometimes that comes by action, where you're willing to pick up trash to try to reach some violent or nasty teenagers that nobody likes in the neighborhood. Why? Because one of the congregations is burdened for them. And we say this, that um, ministry to Arabs and Muslim and nominal Arab Christians is a form of Jewish evangelism. It's got to go both ways. And it's really remarkable when you see uh, Arab believers going to the Jewish community and just simply letting their life shine. And as a result, there's doors that open to speak and share Yeshua. So thank you for the time. Okay, so in case you didn't know him, those of you who were visiting, that was Ed Dickinson, he and his wife Donna, and their two daughters, Devorah and Miriam, are missionaries with uh, OM Israel. And so now we're going to have uh, special music, the believers. Get the uh, projector turned off so you're not having this light side in your face. <laughs>
our brother Sarah Brampton will bring the message. Thank you for the beautiful singing. Greatly appreciate that. A good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, good to see you again, and uh, glad to be here with you here. Um, and uh, brother Dan, especially wanted to give our condolences to you. Uh, he's here. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. We pray. We I heard the news yesterday, and we pray for you. Um, all right. Uh, if you could please open your Bibles to the book of Jude, the epistle of Jude, just right before Revelation. And I'm just going to read verses 8 through 10. Verses 8 through 10. So book of Jude, verses 8 through 10. So let's hear the word of God. Likewise, also these dreamers defile the flesh, reject authority, and speak evil of dignitaries. Yet Michael the archangel, in contending with the devil, when he disputed about the body of Moses, dare not bring against him a reviling accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke you. But these speak evil of whatever they do not know. And whatever they know naturally, like brute beasts, beasts in these things they crop themselves. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for the great opportunity, the great blessing, privilege of being able to come to your church, worship you with my brothers and sisters, and praising your name. Being blessed by beautiful singing, by the words of your scripture, testimony of our brother Ed. Uh, may your blessing be, be upon all of us, helping bring in your word, for without your help, I cannot do anything. And again, I do pray for my brother Dan, that your comfort, the comfort that passes understanding, will just engulf him. And may he, uh, like all of us, rejoice that our dear sister is now free from any pain and in your presence. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Charles Dickens, in his book, his famous book, A Tale of Two Cities, writes, it was the best of time and it was the worst of time. It was a time, it was the age of wisdom and it was the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief and it was the epoch of incredulity. It was a season of light and it was a season of darkness. It was the spring of hope and it was the winter of despair. And you know, it is amazing as if he's describing the state of Christianity in our time. In some way, it's the best of times. The gospel in adv is advancing in many parts of the world, in places that you couldn't even imagine. Who would imagine, uh, when was it, two years ago, when American forces left Afghanistan and that fanatic Islamic group Taliban took over. Uh, everybody thought that's the end of Christian work and Christian missionaries in Afghanistan. But uh, just past week we had three... Uh, Afghan gave their lives to the Lord inside the Afghanistan under Taliban. And last year I also reported two families of Afghan inside Afghanistan came to know the Lord through the radio ministry. People coming to faith in some of the most closed countries. Closed countries for us, but not for the Lord. The gospel in its clear message, the power of the gospel, the love of God in Jesus is advancing. And the technology, the advancement of modern technology has made it possible for people in some of the most remote parts of the world to have translation of the Bible in many languages, to hear the gospel in their own language, to be able to ask questions, argue, you know, uh, Mitra spends hours and hours responding to these people. You know, some of them are rude, some of them insult, some of them, you know, say horrible things. But out of ten, two, three people come to faith. So there's always, uh, we look, we ask God to guide and lead us to his own sheep, and he does that. So it's the best of time. Um, we have a brother here at our church came to faith. And he's going to be baptized uh, in month of March. So the, world, the Lord is working all around the world. 
But it's also worst of times because so many false teachers and false teaching have poisoned the teaching and preaching of the true gospel. The true gospel that declares to us that we can have peace with God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, there is an advancement of technology that has made it possible for the gospel to be accessible to all parts of the world, but also sheep, also wolves in sheep clothing have also attached themselves to these media. So many people are deceived by them. So many people think that they are saved because they follow empty promise of these false shepherds. Just... Uh, Last September, we had a guy, uh, a pastor, uh, Iranian pastor up in Los Angeles, the guy who was well known, suddenly started teaching some strange teaching, teaching about cosmic Christ. That, you know, there is somehow this spirit of cosmic Christ is moving everywhere and anybody, everybody is going to be saved somehow. But it doesn't matter whether you actually put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ or not. So, there are these people who are deceived by the empty promises of these false shepherds, and unless by God's grace they hear the true gospel and come to the saving faith in Christ, they are headed directly toward hell. They are deceived. There are wolves in sheep clothing in modern day churches, so in, in some ways it's also the worst of times. It's the best of times, and it's the worst of times. And Jude, in his short epistle, is writing about the danger of these hidden wolves. Uh, he's writing between the years of 67, 70 AD in first century. It is as if he's describing our time. Jude was a half-brother of Christ, a brother of James, who was a leader of the Jerusalem Council and a leader, a leader in the Jerusalem Church. Uh, James, who wrote the epistle of James. But, you know, it's interesting. If you read the epistle of Job, you take a note at it, it's interesting that Jude doesn't mention any of these things, doesn't mention any of his family relationship to Christ. He doesn't say, you know, I'm a half-brother of Lord Jesus Christ, so you better accept me, you better listen to me and send your money. He doesn't boast about this, no, rather he introduces himself as Jude, a bound servant of the Lord Jesus Christ, in verse 1. And that shows his humility in contrast to those false shepherds that he's going to expose. And initially he wanted to teach about the gospel, that's the best news, what else? You know, just being able to teach and preach the gospel. In verse 3, he says, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation. But under the inspiration and conviction of the Holy Spirit, he, he turned to warn uh, the believers about the hidden enemies who are inside the church. He continues, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saint. The faith that is given, the faith that is not hidden, the faith that is public. But uh, there are these uh, shepherds, uh, these false shepherds who are infiltrating the church of Christ and the gospel itself is in danger. Why is Jude so concerned about the future of the gospel and the church? Because in verse 4 he says, for certain men have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men who turned the grace of our God into lewdness and denied the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Certain men, and I must add in our time certain women too, have crept in unnoticed. They are hidden. Believers do not notice them at first, they are like spiritual terrorists. They are like those terrorists at 9-11 who entered this country and they were instructed to look like the native people. You know, don't grow 
huge beard, <laughs> uh, wear uh, you know Muslim traditional clothing, don't have a shaved face, and even drink alcohol and eat pork. Doesn't matter. You are allowed to do that for the cause that they were going to do for the destruction that they were going to do, so that you will not draw attention to yourself. And once you were settled in, and once you were just ready, then blow up your bombs. And this is a sad story in Christianity in our time too. There are these spiritual terrorists who have infiltrated into the body of Christ, and they are blowing up their bombs. They have infiltrated the church, pretending to be pastors, teachers, but whose intentions were not and are not to glorify God, and they don't want to serve His people. They misuse and abuse believers for their own gains, for their own gains. Now, in the words that we read from verse 8 to 11, we have one of the really great section, a great structured section in the New Testament literature. In fact, going back from verse 5 to verse 11, it is remarkably carefully crafted portion of a scripture, very well structured. Here we have the unmasking of these spiritual terrorists, spiritual enemies of our Lord. The spiritual enemies of the truth, so dangerous as to record such a vivid language and such a vivid condemnation. And Jude is very, very structured here. In verse 5 through 7, you have three cases of apostate judgment, three cases of God judgment on apostasy. The first one in verse 5, the second in verse 6, and the third in verse 7. Then in verses 8 through 10, you have three characteristics of uh, false teachers, of apostate people. Um, three cases of judgment, verses 5 through 7, one on... Uh, a generation of Israel, one on angels, one on Sodom and Gomorrah, then three characteristic of uh, or disposition of the apostate people. False teacher verses 8 through 10. They are immoral, they are insubordinate, and they are irreverent. And then in verse 11, you have three comparison of um, uh, apostate in the Old Testament, Cain, Balaam, and Korah. So you see, it's a very carefully crafted uh, portion of the scripture, tree by tree by tree. First, three cases of apostate judgment, verses 5 through 7. Let me read, the, read these verses. Uh, uh, Jude writes, I desire to remind you, though you know all things once for all, that the Lord, after saving a people out of the land of Egypt, subsequently destroyed those who did not believe, that generation did, that did not believe. And angels who did not keep their own domain but abandoned their proper abode, he kept in eternal bounds or chain, under darkness for a judgment of the, that great day. And then, just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, since they, in the same way as the angels, indulge in gross immorality, immoralities and went after a strange flesh, which is talking about homosexuality, called sodomy. And they are exhibited as an example in undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. Jude says, the first illustration is a gen unbelie unbelieving generation in Israel. God delivered Israel out of Egypt and then because a generation of them defected from them, be defected from him, because they become immoral, insubordinate, and irreverent. God destroyed that generation in the wilderness because of their apostasy. And then the angels who dwelt with God in the heaven of heavens rebelled, abandoned their proper abode, came all the way down. Once they became what we call demons, some of them came down and cohabited to uh, demonic men with the daughters of men, as recorded in Genesis chapter 6, and in one of the horrific expression of evil of the world that God drowned in the flood. 
the angels, fallen angels, possessing men, these men are demon possessed, and engaging with those men in marriage demon dominated, that so affected families and children as to make God drown the world, the Noah's flood. And there, there of course, is Sodom and Gomorrah. The horrific sin, the homosexual passion ran so hot among the people of these cities that they even tried to rape angels who came there to visit Lot. In each case, there's a judgment. Verse 5 says uh, that unbelieving generation in Israel were destroyed. Verse 6 says the angels are kept, those angels or demons are kept in eternal bond under darkness for judgment of that great day. And Sodom and Gomorrah were just burned up. And even now, those people, the inhabitants of those cities, are awaiting the punishment of eternal fire. They were consumed physically, their cities and themselves were consumed by fire, and they are now in burning torment, awaiting the final hell and the lake of fire to come at the end. So, Jude establishes then this about apostate. Whoever they are, doesn't matter. Unbelieving Jews, fallen angels, whether it's a Jew, an angel, or Gentile in Sodom and Gomorrah, when you rebel against God, there will be severe judgment. So in helping to understand helping us to understand apostasy, apostasy we begin with these three cases of apostate judgment. Then we come to the second point, three characteristics of, of apostate nature. And this is where we learn why God treats them the way he does. Look at verse 8. It says, yet in the same manner, in the same manner, these men, what men? These men, identified in verse 4. These men, certain persons who have crept in unnoticed, marked out for condemnation, ungodly person who turn the grace of our God into lightiousness and deny our master and Lord Jesus Christ. These men against which we must contend for the purity of our faith, for the gospel uh, once for all delivered to all the saints. Likewise, these men defy flesh, reject authority, and revile against angelic majesties. And he pulls the whole story of those three cases right into the discussion of the apostate. Apostates are just like uh, immoral, irreverent, insubordinate Israel, angels, Sodom and Gomorrah. Apostates do the very same thing. They defy the flesh, that is immorality. They reject authority, that's insubordination. They revile angelic majesty, that's irreverence. And there are the three characteristics, these are the three characteristics of the apostate nature. Immorality, insubordination, and irreverence. You can find another word for irreverence uh, would be blasphemy. Now, one another thing that strikes you when you read verse 8. It says, likewise, these men, these apostates, also by dreaming. Dreaming, what is it saying to us by dreaming? You know, one of the main characteristics of false teachers, false shepherds, is that they always into dreams and vision because they need to have some kind of source of authority. Now, I'm not denying that if the Lord wills, He can and He does um, manifest Himself to people, especially in many uh, difficult parts of the world in dream and vision, but those dream and vision that are truly from the Lord always dream the person back to the Word of God. They don't uh, encourage rebellion. They, they don't encourage another gospel. Even the dream and vision we have in the New Testament, they always refer to some written references in the Scripture. But these people, these apostate dreamers, they are categorically dreamers. So what does it say? It says, well, you know, the word used here, the word in Greek is used only one another place in the New Testament. And that other place is in the book of Acts. 
uh, chapter 2, verse 17. In Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost, which he refers to the book of Joel, chapter 2, verses 28 and 29. And this is what Joel, chapter 2, verses 28 and 29 says. It shall be in the last day, God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all mankind, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see vision, and your old men shall dream dreams. And this is the word that is used here and also in the epistle of Jude. It is not a normal word for dream. It's a word in the New Testament associated with dreams and prophecy. It's a dream that has revelation in it, kind of associated with visions and prophecies. But we know that all prophecies stopped by the end of the writing of the New Testament. So there cannot be new prophecy. That's impossible. You can read the book of Revelation and the final warning at the end of the book of Revelation. So what we have here then is that false teachers, false shepherds, inevitably have they need to have some kind of source of authority for their deception they need to have a source that is believable and has authority they have to have a source that has that gives them some kind of authority and convince people you know they cannot just say well i think such and such a things they can't just say i feel even though these days you hear that very often that people say, I feel this way or I feel that way. Um, and based on their feeling, they want, make, they want to make decision on the word of God. But they can't just say that. They can't just say, I think or I feel. Uh, uh, you know, they, they don't come and say, well, you know, we uh, formed a committee or a group and we came up with this idea. No. Uh, in order for these false teachers to be effective, they need to somehow claim that they have communication directly with God and God communicate with them directly and tells them secret things in their dreams and vision that other people do not have access to them. Apostate false teachers from, very simple, go back to from Muhammad, the false prophet of Islam, to Joseph Smith of Mormonism, to our modern time, Benihim. They all, and everybody in between, uh, they all claim that they speak, God speaks to them in dreams and vision. And this, of course, transcends the necessity of the Word of God. They, they claim that they transcend the necessity to obey and be submissive to the written Word of God which is not in their heart anyway and um, when they use this uh, dream and vision that gives them an illusion of authority and god gets blamed for all their errors you know you know the false dreams and vision of muhammad has caused many people in our time to turn away from god completely you know praise god for those who come to faith in the lord jesus christ by the preaching of the gospel but at the same time because many people in countries like Iran Afghanistan have been turned off by uh, evil of Islam they just have turned away from God completely false teachers reject the authority of the written Word of God they reject the Word of God completely false teacher as I said I mean they may use the Word of God but they misuse it, misinterpret it for their own advantage. False teacher, as I said, they have, they need to have a source, source of authority for deception, for their deception. For, uh, let me take you to the very interesting portion in the Old Testament for a minute. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 13. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 13, verse 1. It says, if a prophet or a dreamer of dreams you see i mentioned that god can use vision and dream if he wills but you know here we are talking about people that constantly constantly are in vision and dream you know that's not normal uh, 
God, the normal method of God's communication to us is through His Word. Now, there can be exception in some exceptional cases and exceptional places, but to make what is exception as a standard rule, to always have dream and vision, there is something wrong. Watch out for that. If a prophet or a dreamer of dreams uh, arises among you and gives you a sign or a, or a wonder, and the sign and the wonder, pay attention, comes true, comes true, concerning which he spoke to you. You know, Satan can fabricate some things, can he? And it comes true to you, saying, let us therefore, now you saw what I said came true, therefore let us go after other gods, or Jesus that is not the Jesus of the scripture, whom you have not known, and let us serve them, false teachers, false apostates, always do that, and the word of God caution us in Deuteronomy 13, be careful, this is a test, don't fall for it. They want to direct you away from the truth, away from God, because they are immoral, because they are insubordinate, and they are irreverent. Deuteronomy continues, says, even if the sign or wonder comes true, verse 3, you shall not listen to them. You shall not listen to the words of that prophet or the dreamers of dream. For the Lord your God is testing you to find out whether if you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. Now, this is a test. You follow a false prophet, you follow a dreamer of dreams, you have failed the test. Verse 4, you shall follow the Lord your God and fear Him. Here we go. And you shall keep His commandment, listen to His voice, serve Him, clinch to Him. Clinch to the pure gospel, to pure word of God. Don't go off walking off with some dreamer. If anybody comes along and tells you God talked to him in a dream, clinch to the word of God. Check everything with the word of God. Don't follow that dreamer. The New Testament warns us about this in Colossians chapter 2 verse 18. They, uh, these false teachers led real Christians astray. No question. Here's a warning. Verse 18, Colossians chapter 2. Let no one keep defrauding you of your prize, literally stealing your eternal reward by delighting in self-abasement, worship of angel, and taking his stand on vision he has seen. That's his source of authority. Our source of authority is the word of God, properly read, properly understood. We are warned again and again about that. They lead people astray. And 1 Timothy chapter 4 says, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit expressly says in the latter times, some will fall away from the faith because they pay attention to deceitful spirit and doctrines of demons by means of hypocrisy of liars who are seared in their conscience. Beware of those people who are dreamers. Now, let's spread that out, those three things those three characteristics of apostate. Let's look at characteristic number one, going back to the book of Jude, verse eight. These dreamers defile the flesh. Apostate false teachers are inevitably immoral. It may not publicly visible because they cover it up, but the corruption is there and it will show up one way or another and is unrestrained. It has to be because they have abandoned the truth. Verse 19 says, and this is very noteworthy, they are devoid of the Spirit. They are devoid of the Holy Spirit. They do not have the Holy Spirit. Therefore, there is no divine power to restrain their flesh. Secondly, they reject authority. Obviously, if you're going to live an immoral life and love your lust, and love your sin, you're going to have to reject authority. You will have problem with authority, divine authority. And that's very interesting. It says they reject authority in verse eight. That is to say they reject established authority. They reject any rule over them. 
They deny our Master and Lord Jesus Christ. Now, don't be deceived. It doesn't mean that they deny Jesus Christ openly. They may talk about Jesus and they may proclaim, they may say that Jesus is Lord, but they will not come under His authority, under His uh, authority as Lord Jesus Christ. They have their own self-styled authorities. This is arrogance. This is arrogant rejection of God's rule and authority and lordship of Christ over his church. They do not submit to Christ's authority revealed through the scripture. But rather they have their own theology and their own view uh, span out of their own dreams and imagination and dreams. And let me mention the third thing. Third in the list of characteristics of these false teachers is they revile angelic majesties. Revile is the word blaspheme. They blaspheme. And uh, then we have a little interesting phrase, angelic majesties. It's talking about here is how false teachers and apostates blaspheme angels. And they do. Now, how? It's very interesting to look at that. If we ask the question, how do the false teacher blaspheme angel, it might not come immediately into your mind uh, what the answer is. But we need to go back to the book of Deuteronomy chapter 33. In Deuteronomy chapter 33, Moses is repeating some of the things about the history of Israel. He, of course, is about ready to die, and he calls the sons of Israel together before his death, and he says to them in verse 2, Deuteronomy chapter 33, he reminds them of history. He reminds them of God coming down at Sinai. The Lord came from Sinai and down on them from Seir. He shone forth from Mount Paran. Notice this, he came forth from the, uh, he came from the midst of 10,000 holy ones at his right hand, there flashing lightning for them. Indeed, he loved the people, all thy holy ones are in thy hand. Here God is pictured coming down at Sinai with literally 10,000 angels, myriads of holy angels. Now, what do we remember what happened at Mount Sinai? What was given at Mount Sinai? The law, the commandment. And here for the first time, the angels, the holy angels are associated with the giving of the law. The Lord is among them as at, the, at Sinai in holiness. When God came down at Sinai to give the law, uh, the angels were there and they were in a massive force, 10,000 times, 10,000, thousand upon thousand. It is as if the whole army of heaven's holy angels came down at Sinai in this monumental event of giving of the law. Now, what we learn from these passages is that in some fashion, in some way, the angels... The holy angel played a very special role in dispensing of the law of God at Sinai. Turn over Galatians to Galatians chapter 3 verse 19. Galatians 3 verse 19 says, Why the law then? It was added because of transgression, having been ordained through angels. The angels played a very particular, a special role in the giving and ordaining the law of God. And so, whether they recognize it or not, the apostate teachers, in their immorality, when they break the commandment, in their subordination, in the blasphemy of God, they blaspheme not only Christ, not only the Holy Spirit, not only the Father, not only the holy angels, but they, uh, but the, I mean, not only the Father, but they also blaspheme the holy angels. Because the point is so unusual, then Jude gives us a further, another example, further consideration by contrast, by way of contrast, to see the seriousness of their sin. Look at verse 9, Jude, going back to Jude, look at verse 9. It says, Michael the archangel, when he disputed with the devil, argued about the body of Moses, 
did not dare to pronounce against the devil a railing judgment, but said, The Lord rebuke you. The Lord rebuke you. But these men revile the things which they do not understand and the things which they know by instinct like unreasoning animals, beasts. By these things they are destroyed. The point that Jude makes here is very powerful. It says, Michael, who is himself a holy angel, an archangel, would not even revile Satan, who is a fallen angel. That's an amazing contrast. Michael, who is himself a holy angel, would not himself blaspheme a fallen angel. And yet these false teachers will blaspheme the holy angels when they break the commandment by their immoral, irreverent, and insubordinate lifestyle. Michael the archangel, his name means who is like God. So uh, now we are, uh, uh, we are coming to the highest level of angelic order. He, Michael the archangel, he knew the Lucifer. He knew him when he was the son of the morning, when he was an anointed cherub, when he was around the throne of God, when he was the heavenly choir director. He knew the, or, the other demons, all of them being created together at once. And when they fell, Michael the archangel knew they fell. He knows he has power over Satan. He knows Satan is fallen, and yet he has respect for the angelic enemies of God, even though he's a powerful holy angel. His power as a holy angel is delegated as his function to do whatever God tells him to do and not act independently on his own. He will not usurp divine authority. He will not exercise his own will over Satan. He will not uh, on his own blaspheme even Satan. And in fact, you know, the verse 9 gives us a model how to deal with demonic attack. Ask the Lord to rebuke the demon. You know, when I pray, I want to talk to my Heavenly Father. Or I would like to, I want to talk to my Lord Jesus Christ. I don't want to talk to Satan. So, when I'm praying, I don't start attacking or uh, talking to Satan. I ask the Father to rebuke Satan. I ask the Father to uh, nullify his work and his scheme and his plan and protect me and others from his attack. I ask the Father, we need to learn from the example of the Michael the Archangel. God has his plan for Satan and God knows what they are and Michael will carry them out, but he will not act independently. He will not intrude, he will not do things on his own. And one of the things he will not do is he will not bring against the devil a railing judgment, but rather he will say to the devil, the Lord rebuke you, and we should follow the example of Michael. Jude reversed the reader's expectation to prove the point of verse 8. He's saying, apostate, blaspheme the holy angels by their disregard of God's holy law. Which angel... The angel ordain and protect and guard that those, those holy law. Apostles have the gall to blaspheme holy angels by their disregard of God's law, while holy angels do not even blaspheme demons. They wanted to show us how, uh, what a uh, rebellious nature these apostate teachers have. And that's what he did, going back to Jude chapter 9, on, on that very strange occasion. The occasion was when Michael was disputing with the devil and arguing about the body of Moses. God wanted the body of Moses to be buried in an unknown place, in an unmarked grave, so that uh, no one would ever know and uh, it will, uh, no one would come to venerate it, it will not become a shrine. Well, Satan wanted that body. Uh, you may wonder what, what, what does he wanted to do with the body of Moses. As I said, I, my guess is he wanted to turn that uh, to a place to be worshipped. He wanted to use that even, even the body of Moses as a means of misleading people into idolatry 
and build a shrine over the uh, grave of Moses. But that wasn't God's intention. Michael was given the responsibility to bury that body and the way that Michael dealt with Satan, we should, and that should be an example for us, was, uh, and that's the only way you can deal with him, was he said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you. The Lord rebuke you. And that's the way you deal with him. If you go to book of Deuteronomy chapter 34, verses 5 to 6, we read about the burial of Moses. It says, so Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord, and he, a mysterious person, it is Michael the archangel, buried him under the authority and commission of the Lord, buried him in a valley in the land of Moab, opposite Bethpur, and no one knows his grave to this day because God doesn't want his didn't want his grave to become a shrine and a uh, so, uh, and a means of idolatry. This is very interesting point. Apostate not only rebukes Satan with as amazing presumption, but they teach their immature believers to do the same thing as well. And in addition, they also blaspheme the holy angels by their sinful lives, which shows their disdain for the holy law of God which is so precious and so sacred for the angels. They are in a true sense, uh, the holy angels, the guardian of God's holy law. And whenever these false teachers are characterized by materialism, pride, insubordination to the word of God, immorality, whenever they are characterized by anger and uh, power hunger, whatever it is, they are violating holy laws of God they are then in the true sense blaspheming angelic majesties. So, it is true. This is the best of time, and it's the worst of time. It's the best of time that I can report to you three Afghans in Afghanistan came to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ through radio ministry, and it's the worst of time that, unfortunately, I have to tell you that there are many, many people in both countries, Iran and Afghanistan, who have turned away from God because of the false prophets, false teachers. That's why we must contend earnestly for the faith that which was once for all delivered to the saints. The very gospel itself is in danger and we have the responsibility to whoever we are, in whatever uh, area, whatever sphere of influence we have, to share and present the gospel in truth of the scripture to people around us. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for the opportunity to study your word, to learn from uh, Michael the Archangel, to learn from your servant Jude, and to be aware of the dangers. Thank you for um, all the blessing that you have given us for the means that we can preach and present the gospel, whether through media or the best way, person by person, face to face, talking to people. May we use all means from a simple track to media and radio and TV ministry and whatever. May we not be silent and share the scripture, especially when there are these wolves who are attacking people all around the world. For we pray all these things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Please stand and turn to number 582, 582.
sheep have gone astray and turned each one to our own way, Lord. And we just pray, Lord, help us to just follow the leading of your Spirit, that we'd be available and usable for you, that people would see Christ in us, the hope of glory. Help us to be ready to give an answer to anyone who would ask of us a reason of the hope that we have with meekness and fear. For we know we cannot do anything apart from you, but we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Now help us, Lord, to be a blessing this week. Lord, that you would use us to get the word out to redeem the time where the days are evil and we know the time is running short and we pray that we would be busy uh, just letting the light shine that people would know that we are Christians by the love we have one for another and use us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> Thank you. 